So the, uh, the sermon I've got this afternoon is um, the right types of fear. So um, what we saw there in uh, Jeremiah 46, um, you know, the Lord is telling them not to fear because he's got the battle in hand and he's the one who's going to judge righteous or, or unrighteous, you know, who's going to be punished. Um, so I want to start, I've got three points today, but I want to start with the first point. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 12, verse 29, and the first point is to fear not. You know, this is a command from God and an instruction from God, and we're going to see that throughout the scripture. Um, but we'll start in Luke chapter 12, verse 29. It says, And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have and give alms, provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So there's the instruction there to, to fear not. Now that, that is an instruction from God, but we're to seek the kingdom of God and he'll take care of our needs. So we don't need to fear about where our needs are going to come from because we have the Father who's going to take care of us. Um, and that's why we should be fixated on the heavenly things, on the kingdom of God, and not fixated on the things of this earth. Um, because the wants and needs of this earth, God's going to take care of. Um, but we want to build up rewards in heaven where neither moth nor rust can corrupt. And they, they're going to last forever, those rewards, those gold, silver, and precious stones. So that's why we need to be fixated on those things. Um, but also not to, uh, uh, we need to keep the commandments and also walk in the new man. Um, because that's how we can live without fear. Um, because fear is in your flesh, and it's actually one of the sins of the mind, is fear. Uh, we're not to live in fear. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Now, we've heard great sermons in the last couple of weeks about partaking in the afflictions of others, in the tribulation of others, and you know, rejoicing with them, and and also being being sorrowful when they're sorrowful, and these are these are again great ways. We don't live in fear, um, but we partake of those things. You know, when when Paul's a prisoner and things like that, then you know the other disciples also um, would sorrow for him or would rejoice with him. Um, but it's a great verse on what the result is of lot of not living in fear. Because you're not ashamed of the testimony of Christ, nor being afraid to preach the gospel. Um, we'll get you to turn to Revelation 21.7. Um, we'll all be pretty familiar with this. It's one of the verses we use when our soul winning. But in Revelation 21.7, it says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, we tend to concentrate a lot on the all liars, but as well as the murderers, abominations as well. But it also says that the fearful, you know, the fearful, it's listing it here amongst other sins. And these are other, other sins that the unbelieving will see themselves cast into hell for. For, for, for fearing men but not fearing God. You know, so... Uh, and, and we're just going to be looking at some of the right and wrong types of sin, uh, of fear today, because fearing God is a command of God, um, but living in fear is a sin. Um, so we should fear the Lord only. Um, I'll get you to turn to Genesis chapter 20. Um, but in Genesis 15.1... It says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So again, we see, saw back in Luke, you know, our shield and our great reward, that is the Lord. And if we fear the Lord, but we fear not man, um, then we'll have him as our reward. We'll have him as our shield, our tower of strength. And that command was given to Abraham to fear not. And when God commands something, you can believe it. Um, and that's what Abram did. It says when he fear, you know, when God says to fear not and go down to Egypt, then you better get down to Egypt. You know, you, uh, when he says your seed will be the stars of heaven, then Abram believed him and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. 
And he feared God, even that um, he was going to offer his son, not fearing what would happen to Isaac. Um, I'll read to you from Hebrews eleven seventeen. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So Abraham was not afraid of what would happen to his son. He, he, had, he had his son Isaac, who was promised that through this seed would come Christ and would be an innumerable number of people part of this spiritual nation of Israel. So when he offered to sacrifice him, he knew that his son, nothing was going to come to him. But why was that? Because he believed God, because he had faith in God. But we're about to see here in Genesis chapter 20, this is where Abraham's actually fearing man, um, which brings trouble to the nation that he was in. So instead of being honest and truthful, he doesn't give the whole truth about his wife and says it's his sister, which is the truth, but it's only a half-truth. And it almost caused Abimelech to sin against the Lord and Abraham. So we'll pick up in verse 9 in Genesis 20. It says, And Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us, and what have I offended thee, that thou hast brought upon me and my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and thou will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister, she is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And, you know, he goes on to explain that he, he agreed with, with Sarah ahead of time that they were going to say that she was his sister. But we see what happened here. Um, Abimelech ends up having to give an offering to Abraham to make... Um, to make things right between him and Sarah. Um, but also it says that um, in verse 18, for the Lord had fast closed up the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abram's wife. So Abraham's thinking about how he's going to be treated, but he doesn't stop to think about, you know, what's going to happen to the people if he causes them to sin. And God actually had cursed that nation by closing up the wombs of all the maidservants and the women in the land, um, even though Abimelech did nothing wrong. Um, but we see that Abraham feared man because he thought that there was no fear of God in the land. Um, and if God had not intervened, they could have gone so much worse. Like Abimelech could have committed fornication or adultery with, with Abraham's wife. It would have been a lot worse for that nation. You know, just what could have happened if he'd, if he'd just spoken the truth? Um, and we need to understand that we fear God because he'll protect us from man. He'll protect us from these circumstances. But we just need to be truthful. Um, but we'll see, I'll get you to turn to Malachi chapter 3, because we'll see what happens when the fear of God isn't in a place. Um, and we only need to look at our own country. This country does not fear God. And we see the state of godlessness that it brings. You know, this country is full of murder and abortion, fornication and adultery, you know, the sodomites and transgenders and all of that is rampant in this land. That's because there's no fear of God in this land. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold, I'll send my messenger, he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like full of soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold, and silver, and they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I'll come near to you to judgment. I'll be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, and against false swearers, against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and they that turn aside from the stranger from his right, and fear not me, said the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I'll return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? So we see the state of Israel at this time is pretty poor. 
you know, they'd forsaken all the ordinances and statutes of the Lord. He specifically brings up tithes and offerings of where they've been robbing God. But you also see that they have sorcerers and other abominations, adulterers, false swearers. Uh, and these are all wicked things. So when you lose the fear of God, you lose the fear to keep his commandments, you know, to actually walk after his ways. And you, fear the ju- you don't fear the judgment of God, that God is going to judge you. He says, I'm going to come down and I'm going to bring judgment if you don't get right. And we need to understand that too. It's the fear of God that dr- drives us to keep his commandments and to love him, to walk after him and to serve him. It's, as it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge and understanding. So point number two is to fear God. Because while God does say to fear not, one thing he does command us to do is to fear God himself. So I'll get you to turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. But uh, when, you, when you're afraid of anything other than God, when your fear is anywhere other than God himself, then that is sin. So we should fear the chastisement of the Lord because that's healthy. You know, it says we're all partakers. But when you sin against God, it should fill you with some fear of how he's going to deal with you through chastisement, his judgment. And that's why we repent, because we want that mercy, we want that grace. If you don't repent and you don't get right with God, then that chastisement may be very severe. And you will find that in Hebrews chapter 12. But you'll also find in 1 Corinthians 5 that if you're doing one of these sins that gets you cast out of church, that you're actually given over for the destruction of the flesh to Satan to destroy you. Again, we should fear that. We should fear being cast out of church. We should fear doing these sins. We should fear the chastisement of the Lord. But also anxiety and fear, they're not part of the new man. They're part of the old man. They're part of the flesh. They're works of the flesh. And they are, they are sins of the mind. And we're not to walk after those things. You know, living in constant fear. If you live in constant fear, then that's sin. And you need to repent of that. Um, and seek your shelter from the Lord. We'll get to that later on. But we shouldn't even fear death. You know, fear is one of those devices the devil will use to actually keep you from doing good works. Um, and we're, it says we're not ignorant of his devices. So in Revelation 2a, we see the following command from God. It says, And under the angel, verse 8, And under the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. Ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. Of course, we know that second death is, is the lake of fire. But he's talking about how these are things that definitely happen to this church, but could happen to us as well. The devil could throw us into prison. You know, he could cause us to even be put to death, but we're not to fear those things. And you could even have a fear of losing friends over doctrine. You know, and you shouldn't have respect of persons or hold a friendship higher than you hold the truth and doctrine, because they should come first. So you preach what's right. And if that offends, so be it. You know, you don't want to fear man and be cowardly in your preaching. You don't want to hold back. You just want to speak the truth. And as we say around here, let the chips fall where they may. You know, because we are independent. This is an independent Baptist church. And Christ is the head of this church. And Christ is the head of us as well in our own lives. And if someone hates me for the truth, then I'll just count that as a blessing. You know, I've got a clear conscience before God. And I'm not concerned with how people will see me. So I'll get you to turn to 2 Kings verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 33. And we get clear instruction to serve the Lord and to fear the Lord only. So it's speaking here, of course, about um, at this time, I believe, the United Nation of Israel, but I, I can't say for sure. <laughs> It says, they feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. Sorry, I'm in verse 33. It says, under this day they do after the former manners. They fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law and commandment which 
the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel, with whom the Lord hath made a covenant and charged them, saying, You shall not fear other gods, nor bear down yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and a stretched out arm, him shall ye fear, and him shall ye worship, and to him shall ye do sacrifice. And the statutes and ordinances and the law and the commandment which he wrote unto you, the covenant that I have made for you, ye shall not forget, neither shall ye fear other gods, but the Lord your God ye shall fear, he shall deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. Howbeit they did not hearken, but they did after their former manner. So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. And as Brother Cullen preached this morning, you can't serve a God over here and then, you know, you repent part way and you want to believe both. This is what they're trying to do here. They're trying to serve the God of Israel, but they're also trying to serve their idols. And that just isn't going to cut it. You know, he gives a clear instruction. You can't have it both ways. You can't serve the Lord and you can't serve idols. You know, if you fear men and you fear other gods, then you'll never be able to fully serve the Lord God and you'll never fully fear the Lord God. Nor, nor will you keep your statutes and commandments. We saw that's how they ended up. Is it just ends up in just anarchy, just all kinds of sin, all kinds of wickedness. So I'll get you to turn to Daniel chapter 3 because we're going to look at some other characters now. And these are some men who are fearless. And I think that's an important thing for us as well, to also be fearless, like these great men before us. So we're going to see Daniel chapter 3, verse 10. This is uh, Daniel in the fiery furnace. Sorry, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. In verse 10 it says, Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music and shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth it, that he shall be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready at what time ye hear the sound of the corn, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the fiery, burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, and I love this, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he'll deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So these men were not even afraid unto death. They said, look, if the Lord delivers us, he's going to deliver us. If he doesn't deliver us, we're going to die, we're going to be with him anyway. Amen. So you can't lose. And this is the thing, in our life we cannot lose. They can't threaten us with death. We're never going to taste of death. So, and I just love it. He says, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. They didn't even have to think about it. We didn't even have to think about the answer. We're not going to bow down and worship you. We're not going to worship your golden idol. You have to kill us. So we know the story. They were thrown into the furnace and they were saved by, by the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we believe that's an appearance of, of the Lord in the fiery furnace with them. And they weren't harmed, even though it was set multiple times above, you know, what it was able to handle. And the men who even threw them in were burnt up but they themselves were spared. So this is the saving power of God. This is, this is God's salvation. Um, we'll get you to turn to Daniel chapter 6. We'll, of course, read about Daniel in the lion's den. Another great man who was not afraid, even unto death. So Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now, I love how this opens up. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, 
He went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So as soon as he knows that it's against the law to bow down and worship the God of, the God of heaven, the God of Israel, then he goes and does exactly that. And he does it openly because he's not afraid. He doesn't care what they're going to do to him. And the king says the same thing. When he heard these things, he was so displeased with himself and sent his heart on Daniel to deliver him. Like the king didn't want Daniel to fall for this. But he realized that he'd made a mistake when he made this law. But that still didn't change Daniel's heart. He was still openly defying the king. And we see what happens to him afterwards in, in verse 21. It says, Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner was of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. So again, this is the important part here, that he feared God. He didn't fear men, he didn't fear the lions. He believed that God would spare him from that, just like he did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't fear man. They feared the Lord, and the Lord spared them. He spared them from, from what they were going to go through. And we see also with Jonathan. You know, Jonathan was also fearless. That's the friend of David, the son of Saul. In 1 Samuel 14, it says, Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young men that bear his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison. That is on the other side. But he told not his father. And verse 6, it says, And Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, and it may be the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. I mean, look at the fearlessness. He said, look, doesn't matter if it's just two of us. We're going to go up against this garrison. God can do it. Whether there's a hundred of us, whether there's two of us, God can do it just the same. I mean, what great faith he has in the Lord. And that's why if you have great faith in the Lord, you're not going to have fear for anything except for the Lord. And that's where our, our fear and our faith need to be placed, on the Lord himself. We need to fear nothing else. Uh, we'll go down to verse 13. It says, And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands, upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, a half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. So Jonathan's bravery and his armor bearer as well, you know, they feared only the Lord and they turned that battle in their favor because they only feared God. They didn't fear men. And they knew what God was able to deliver them. And it says in verse 23, So the Lord saved Israel that day and the battle passed over into Beth Avon. But we see another man, Noah, he was also fearless. Like when he's building the ark, he had nothing to trust in except the word of the Lord because he'd never seen a flood before and there's dispute whether it even rained before that point, whether he'd even seen rain before. But he believed that God was going to flood the earth and destroy the earth. But he wasn't afraid of that. His fearlessness allowed him to trust in the Lord and to build the ark and to go about and do what he needed to do so that he could survive and his family. And I'd pray that I would have the courage of any of these men to be able to stand up in that time of adversity, you know, so no matter what government or authority is against us, that we can stand defiant against them and say, no, I will worship the Lord my God only and he will protect me. Try, try and do the best you can because it's not good enough. You know, we need to trust in the protection of God. I'll get you to turn to Joshua chapter 10, verse 25. Because there's something that comes up a few times in the Bible as well when it speaks about fearing not. In Joshua 10, 25, it says, And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And afterward Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. And it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded and they took them down off the trees 
and cast them into the cave wherein they had been hid, and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remain unto this day. And that day Joshua took Makeda and smote it with the edge of the sword, and the king thereof he utterly destroyed, them and all the souls that were therein. He let none remain. He did to the king of Makeda as he did unto the king of Jericho. Again, we've got this same God who fights for us. Like the same one who fought for them and gave them all their victories. That's the same God. And it says to fear not, neither be dismayed. Now, being dismayed, what that means is you're concerned or distressed at some unexpected event. So when the unexpected comes up, we're not to fear or be dismayed, but we should turn to the Lord and seek his protection. You know, he's the one who's going to comfort and strengthen us. And he's going to embolden us to fight. So we don't have physical battles and go around slaying people like they did in the Old Testament, but we fight those spiritual battles against principalities, against powers. And the principles are the same because we're fighting daily in ourselves against the flesh. You know, we fight against false doctrine and heresies. We're fighting against false religions and false gospels. You know, we fight for the Lord to save people from hell. Our preaching, our soul winning, and just living day to day, we live in a battle. We're constantly battling. That's why we need to put on the whole armor of God every single day. That's why we should fear the Lord and let him fight for us. Because if we battle on our own, you do it according to the flesh, then you're going to fail. You're going to lose every battle. But if we let the Lord fight our battles, then we'll overcome and we'll have victory. So I'll get you to turn to Psalm 124, verse 1. And I'll read from Romans 8.31. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, uh, now shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So again, if God's for us, who can be against us? Now, we're all born again here, you know. So we're all children of God, and if he's for us, who can be against us? And it says, if he spared not his own son, then wouldn't he freely give us all things? You know, and who's going who's gonna to accuse us? You know, I know that we have the devils called the accuser of the brethren, but who's actually going to accuse us to God? God's the one who judges. God's the one who justifies. So no one can even make accusation against us. Why would we be afraid of that, of just accusations that people can throw at us? They're never going to stick. You know, they can make all the accusations they like, but it's God that justifies and it's God that condemns. And if God doesn't condemn us, he says we'll never come into condemnation, then who's going to condemn us? So you're there in Psalm 124. It says, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So again, it's God who keeps us safe. What have we got to fear? If God's for us, who can be against us? What have we got to fear except for God himself? Because it's only God who can destroy us. You know, we'll get to that in a little bit. Isaiah 35, 3 says, Strengthen you the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. And that's what we saw also in Jeremiah 46. But if God's going to come with vengeance against our enemies, then why do we need to fear our enemies? Like we just let God take care of it. Vengeance belongs unto him. In Isaiah 41.8 says the same thing. But thou Israel art my servant, Jacob whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham my friend, thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. 
Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. So again, vengeance belongs to the Lord. Let him fight for you. You know, our job is to set our hearts in the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He says he'll provide our needs. He'll provide our safety. He'll provide everything for us. We just need to be obedient unto him, and we should fear him. You know, so the Lord's going to deal with our enemies, and we can trust in that because the Lord said it. And uh, Deuteronomy uh, 20, verse 2, it says, And it shall be when ye are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and, ye sh- and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. Fear the Lord your God. For, sorry, for the Lord your God is he that goeth with you and fight for you against your enemies to save you. Again, it's not a physical application, but we have that spiritual application of our enemies. You know, if we love our enemies, then God will pour hot coals upon their head. It's not our job to do that. But last I checked, we are the seed of Abraham. You know, and we're also those who are called by the Lord's name. So while some of those things are applicable to the physical nation of Israel, we are that spiritual nation. And the same God that told them not to fear that he has everything in hand is the same God that we have. So then, why would we live in fear? So uh, Psalm 46 is, uh, is where I got the idea for this sermon. Um, I'll start in verse 1. I'll get you to turn to 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, though. Um, but in Psalm 46, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And because of that, it says, therefore will not we fear. Though the, Lord, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried through the midst of the sea, though the waters are of roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, it says there's no reason why we would fear. Why is that? Because in verse 1, God's our refuge and strength. It says, therefore will not we fear. We won't fear because God's our refuge. He's our strength. In verse 10, it says, be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. I mean, isn't that an amazing thing? When we're gathered here together in church, the Lord of hosts is with us. You know, when we're walking according to righteousness, the Lord is fellowshipping with us. It says the Lord of hosts is with us. He is our refuge. And the Apostle Paul was also fearless. You know, he stood before kings and priests. They sought him harm. But he'd never stopped preaching boldly. You know, that didn't stop him at all. And he even stood up in the midst of people who were worshipping the goddess Diana. He almost got himself killed in the midst of them. There were times where he almost got killed in the, in the temple. But God spared him from each and every one. Um, so you're there in 1 Kings 18, verse 3. So we're going to look at Obadiah as well. It says, And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land unto all fountains of water and unto the brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we not lose all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went about one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him. And he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant under the hand of Ahab to slay me? So we know here, because the narrator has told us, the Holy Ghost has told us, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And there's no question about that. And he also had respect under the prophet Elijah. And, and he, uh, also the other prophets of God, because he hid them in the mountain, you know, and gave them food and water um, to protect them from Ahab. But he also feared man, he feared Ahab. And because of that, he would not speak out publicly. And this is what I want to get to the next point. Because even Joseph, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, he was a disciple of Christ, but not willing to be public because he feared the Jews. And he wasn't the only one, even in the New Testament. You know, and that's, we should not be ashamed, we should not be afraid, you know, like these men were, to speak the truth. 
You know, it doesn't matter who they are. Like Paul stood before kings and he preached the gospel to the kings. Like if, if we're standing next to someone that we're afraid of, we don't preach the gospel to them. Like that's a soul that could be saved. But it's your own fear, it's your own even shame that would cause them not to get saved. And, you know, that is a shame if we allow that to happen. Um, Matthew 5.13, Jesus Christ says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, and that's all of us. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So that's why it's important that we don't fear men, but we fear God. Because if you fear God and you don't fear men, then you're going to preach the gospel to whoever you come across. You're not going to be afraid to open your mouth boldly and speak the gospel like all the disciples and apostles before us. And it says we're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So if we're too afraid to preach the lost, then what are we? It says thenceforth good for nothing. You know, But who can stand against us if the Lord's on our side? So that brings me to the third point. The first point was to fear not. Don't fear men and don't fear other things. The second point was to fear God only because he's worthy of all praise and honour and he is to be feared. But the third point is preaching the gospel without fear and not being a closet Christian. So there may be fear of persecution. I'll get you to turn to Matthew chapter 10. There will be fear of persecution. I mean... It's natural in your flesh to be afraid of it, of persecution, tribulation, even afraid of death. But that's why we're to walk in the, in the new man. The new man's not afraid of those things. The new man has no fear. And uh, in Matthew ten sixteen says, Behold, I send you as forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So God's even sending us into dangerous places and saying, Look, there's going to be danger around, but I'm going to protect you. You know, you do what's right, you open your mouth boldly and I'll protect you. It says, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in the synagogues. You shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought of how you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. You know, so again, there's a crown of life for those who endure to the end. If you can put up with the afflictions, you can put up with the tribulations, and you fear God rather than man, then there's great rewards for you at the end of that. You know, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it's not that God's going to protect you from all persecution, from all tribulation, because we're all going to go through tribulation and persecution. But, see, the Lord will never put you above what you're able to handle. He'll always provide a way, you know, for you to escape the situation like he did for Paul. And they were going to put him to death. It wasn't his time yet. So the Lord allowed him to live as long as the Lord needed him to live. And we get all this fear-mongering by the media, you know, this so-called climate emergency. You know, the governments make laws that are against us, um, you know. But persecution and tribulation will come. The apostles spent time in prison. We haven't had to do that yet, but, I mean, some people here have, have experienced, you know, being arrested and things like that. But again, what did they do? Some of them were broken out by angels of the Lord. Some of them, you know, they were singing hymns while they were locked up, like just giving praises to God because they fear God, they don't fear men. So even again, when they deliver you up to be killed, don't fear. You know, when everyone stands against you, even your own family, don't fear and don't compromise your faith. You know, so trust in the Lord and fear Him. You know, so there were many disciples who were delivered unto death. Like you got Peter, James and, and Stephen. You know, they all died at the hands of men, um, but they didn't fear. They still preached boldly even up until their death. You know, they, they weren't ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and nor should we be. 
So in Jude 123, we're all familiar with this, says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Um, I'll get you to stay in Matthew 10, 26. I'll read to you from Philippians 1, 27. It says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit and one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And that's what we should do in this church too, stand together in one mind and one faith in the gospel. It says, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. So again, God judges those who attack us. God judges our enemies. We don't have to worry about that. And Romans 1.16, again, we're all familiar with this. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And you should be there in Matthew 10, verse 26. It says, Fear not them, fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. Again, don't be ashamed. What God tells us, like we've got God's word here. So we should not be afraid to proclaim anything from here from the housetops. You know, we should be proud of what's in this book. We should be proud of the words of God. You know, and we should be able to speak them openly and boldly. It says, and fear them not. So, yeah, that speaking in line. What you hear in the ear, that preach ye unto the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. So again, some people will need that terror of the Lord to get saved. You know, and it is right for us, as it says in Jude, to instill that fear of God, saving them even by fire. Because we need to convince the unbeliever to believe the gospel. They need to repent. And, you know, the fear of hell and the fear of the wrath of God are very real things. You know, there are some people who do fear hell. They fear going to hell. Well, we can use that to, to get them to listen to the gospel, to believe on the Lord. And that's, a, that's something that we should use. But we need to fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And as Brother Callum brought up this morning too, you might also need to instill the fear of God into your children, not to sin. You know, that they need to repent of their sins every day. You know, whether it be through preaching or using the rod of chastisement. Um, but that's important as well. You know, to use that fear of the Lord to get your children to believe the Lord and to walk according to His ways. But it's also more than that. You know, we're not afraid to preach in this church at least. We're not afraid to preach any of the commandments and statutes of God. Because you know, we'll preach the reprobate doctrine. You know, we'll, we'll preach the post-trib, pre-wrath rapture. We're not afraid of what others might think of us. We're not afraid of losing friends because they might be pre-trib. We're post-trib. Look, if that's something they want to separate over, that's just foolishness. You know, we're, we're not afraid to preach the love of God and the hate of God. You know, the peace of the gospel, but also the wrath of God on the unsaved and the wicked. So Proverbs 22.4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honour and life. And verse 12 says, The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. So the Lord sees when we speak the truth, when we preach the truth, but he overthrows the words of the, of the transgressor. And we saw before that those who, uh, those who swear falsely is someone who God actually judges. So if we speak deceitfully the word of God, we should have the fear of God because we know that God hears us when we speak deceitfully. So you should fear God and know that he's going to be wrathful with you. Um, and just to be honest in your communication, um, especially if you're preaching to the brethren, you know, because we're all God's precious children, but if you're preaching to God's children, then God's going to take notice of what you have to say. 
make sure you're speaking the truth. So I'll come back to Psalm 46, verse 2. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried away in the midst of the sea. So fear God, for he is worthy of all fear and honor and glory. There's none other who's more worthy than him. Because he's the one who can destroy your soul and body. So he will judge us and chastise us. So we should fear him and him alone. So I'll just go over the three points again. So we're commanded not to be fearful. That's one of the sins of the mind, which I'm sure we've all been guilty of at some point. Um, But if you live with fear or anxiety, then you need to repent and seek your shelter in the Lord. Point number two is we're commanded to fear the Lord and him alone. And point number three, that we're not ashamed or afraid to preach the gospel to the lost. And that's why we do confrontational soul winning. We're not afraid to knock on someone's door, a complete stranger, and, and preach the gospel to them, knowing nothing about them. It's not lifestyle evangelism. We don't have to sit down and get to know them for 10 years before we open the Bible. We go door to door and we, we, we just go head on. This is the truth. You know, like it or lump it. So let's pray.